Welcome everyone to Accelerating the Digital Transformation of the NHS with Panopto. I'm Deborah Gerritsen. I'm the Director of Accounts for Panopto and I've been with the company about nine years. Uh, next slide, please. I wanted to introduce our panelists for today. We have Andrew Meyer, Director of Platforms for NHS Digital. We also have Dr. Chris Cristal, an anesthetist from Cambridge University Hospital and Health Education England Education Fellow. And lastly, we have Katie Barnes, Executive Director of Kids Health Matters, and she's also an advanced pediatric nurse practitioner. So before I hand this over to our panelists, I'm just going to do a really brief introduction into Panopto, as well as introduce a case study from the University of Essex. Uh, next slide. So um, Panopto serves nearly 10 million end users across the globe. I'm based in our London office and have been here since the beginning. We work with around 80% of all UK universities. So if you have used Panopto in the past, it might have been through one of your partner institutions. We work with around 2,000 organizations across the globe, and we work with 22 of the top 25 universities in the world, such as Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, Yale, and Stanford, to name a few. So next slide. So what is Panopto? So I'm just going to give you a kind of bird's eye view of Panopto to give you some background. So Panopto is a software-based solution. We have proprietary software, which allows you to record on any device, anywhere, at any time with or without connectivity. This also enables you to record multiple camera feeds or actually any feed at all. So you might have two cameras, slides, and it will all automatically synchronize into one viewing experience. And that includes the automatic captioning, that includes um, the automatic table of contents, all the searchable metadata, all that's done without any editing. It's then stored in our secure cloud in the EU with unlimited storage. And then any of your um, end users, so learners or staff, can then either view the content live or on demand on, on any device, anywhere, at any time with or without connectivity. Um, uh, next slide. I just um, did a screenshot here of a video from Dr. Martin um, Kachara in regards to a laboratory video. Um, it's also linked in the webinar if you'd like to watch that later just to kind of get the full immersive um, experience. Okay, next slide. So before I go into the case study, I always like to take this opportunity to share the top 10 use cases um, in EMEA. So this is for 2020. So um, if you'd like, um, um, a copy of this, please feel free to contact me directly. We're happy to share this. So this is based on Europe. Of course, 80% of our customers are based in the UK. Um, so this is really regarding your peers. So the top use case, again, for like the ninth year in a row is lecture capture. And obviously that's around accessibility and students wanting to learn at their own pace. Next is distance learning. I think this is no surprise to anyone. I hate to say COVID, I'm sure everyone's sick of it, but distance learning has made a huge leap. And that's not just for the NHS, that's not just for university. This is also for corporations. This affects all of us. So how do we enhance our digital offering? Next is how-to videos or video tutorials. These are really good for practical application. Um, we have flipped classroom, which you'll hear about more. By the way, this used to be the second top use case for the past eight years. So it's finally been dethroned. Uh, next is staff training, staff self-reflection. We also have webcasting events and or courses. We have VCMS, which is a video content management system. So basically your own private secure library. Um, we have student recording. We also have captioning. First time that's ever made it. I think it's because of the um, automatic captioning that's become a really big deal. And recorded feedback to students. So I just briefly went over these. If you'd like more information, please feel free to reach out. Um, next slide. So now on to the University of Essex. So the University of Essex turned an upgrade of a nursing skill lab into an opportunity to deliver on-demand recordings and an innovative video feedback to nursing students. So the recording system they had been using prior to this was similar to like CCTV. So they basically recorded one continuous stream and the uh, admins literally had to watch the videos and try to create their own clips to send it out. And when they tried to expand this, the costs were prohibited prohibitive. It just wasn't possible. So the IT team was tasked with finding a new solution. Um, next slide. 
So it brings us to the nursing skill lab. So this is what they were looking for. They were looking for a way, uh, well, an interactive educational environment. They also wanted to simulate um, both medical emergencies as well as routine procedures. It also needed to be safe, measured, and controlled. Also, um, the um, it needed to be recorded for student self-reflection as well as feedback from the instructors as well. Uh, next slide. So these were the four key features the IT department identified. They needed an integration with their LMS, including single sign-on. For Essex, they used Moodle. However, it could be any LMS. That's absolutely fine. So for the integration, it was critical that the recordings could be captured and distributed according to the school's modules, associated teachers, and enrolled students, and that access to recordings was limited to the appropriate staff and students. Um, next was scheduling and automation. It was important that the system could be pre-scheduled for time sessions with little to no intervention from academic staff during the teaching session. Um, next, we have ad hoc recording. So despite the preference for um, automated recordings, it was also essential that um, the teachers and staff had the flexibility to start, stop, or extend a session. And lastly, live broadcasting. It was a requirement that the video and the audio from a simulation could be viewed in real time for both assessments and for open days. Great. So I also wanted to highlight some quotes um, from the project before we go to the final results. So this was a great qu um, quote from Natasha Morrison, who is a lecturer in the nursing department. With Panopto, we are able to deliver individual, oh, I'm sorry, did I say next slide? It's okay. Uh, recordings of each student directly to them. This encourages both self and peer review and allows teaching staff to effectively give both formative and summative feedback on every student's performance, improving the overall learning experience experience. Um, next slide. And then one more quote I wanted to share from Matt Softly, the IT manager for Essex. Choosing Panopto to deliver this innovative solution for our nursing staff and students both saved money and increased the functionality we could offer compared to our previous system. So both really good quotes. And um, next slide. And to my final slide, the results. So after this project, they had the ability to create multi-camera rec uh, recording solution with enhanced control over both the recording of the sessions as well as user rights management. They also saw increased functionality across the board while significant, significantly lowering um, total cost of ownership. And lastly, this cutting edge approach attracted considerable attention within the wider nursing community, including a feature in the Nursing Times. This is from quite a few years ago, but I'm sure some of you might have seen it then. Um, perfect. So that concludes my portion. I now want to introduce Andrew, and he's now going to deliver the next presentation. Thank you. And um, hello, everyone. It's uh, a real pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. Uh, my name is Andrew Mayer. Uh, I'm Director of Platforms uh, at NHS Digital. Um, so first, first, let me introduce uh, NHS Digital to, to those people uh, who may not be as familiar with who we are and, and what we do. Um, and, and how we support uh, the NHS across England. Um, I guess at its simplest um, form, we, we do three main things. We, we design, build, deploy, and run uh, some of the national services that support the NHS. We also collect, process, link, and disseminate data for health and care systems. Um, and we also are the cybersecurity partner for, for the NHS, uh, making sure that um, alerts go out uh, should there be uh, any, any signs of uh, cyber uh, attack on, on the system. So pretty much we're, we're front and center uh, of improving lives through the use of, of technology. Um, so for, for me, um, uh, I, I'm more concerned with, with platforms, uh, and that is absolutely about uh, designing, building, uh, and deploying and running those, those national services to, to support, uh, support the NHS. Um, 
we obviously go through a, a process of, of collaborating with, with users, making sure that uh, the products that we, we uh, deliver are fit for purpose and uh, most important, they're going to be used. Um, we also want to make sure that from a, a, uh, an API perspective, uh, it's really, really simple to be able to, to integrate with us. So, you know, our, our core platforms enable the, so that our core platforms can enable a, a wider digital ecosystem to, to innovate and improve experiences and outcomes of, of patients. So that's a little bit about um, NHS uh, Digital uh, and what I do. Um, so really now onto, onto the main, main point uh, of, of my, my section. Um, so I was asked to um, present here today on, on digital transformation. And of course I said, yes, uh, I'd love to do that. But actually it led me to some pretty fundamental questions. Um, what, do, what do we mean by digital transformation? Do we really understand it? We, I, I hear it all the time and, and we just accept without question what it means. Um, but, you know, what, what are we actually transforming from? What are we transforming to? The pretty key, key questions. Um, so if you digitize something, and, and apologies if, if um, uh, people have heard this before, but I think it's worth stating again. You know, if you digitize something, does it really make it better? Um, probably not, uh, especially if it was a bad process in the first place. So, you know, you've got to really understand why you're going on this digital transformation and what you're, you're transforming. And is it for the better? Um, so key things, understanding uh, the business strategy. Um, how, does, how does this transformation fit in with, with that, that journey? Um, we need to challenge some of the, the business processes that exist today. You know, we no longer we, can we just rely on, well, we've always done it like this, so we should continue doing it. Another prime example is you know, people moving to the cloud. You, that's something else that you hear all the time. It's on the cloud. We're moving to the cloud. Well, just moving to the cloud in itself doesn't make things better. It just provides you with another data center. Um, so it's also important to understand what outcomes or, or the effect that, uh, that the transformation will bring. Um, and, and key to this, I think, is is ensuring that you have the right team, um, bringing in service designers to make sure that, um, that the service that you're, you're introducing um, is, is fit for purpose, can be used by, by those people uh, in, in the front um, uh, and the front line, making sure that we've got user researchers and, and user-centered design to make sure that everything looks and feels right um, before it's it's launched. Um, part of my notes, I say, you know, we, we've got to uh, adopt uh, uh, and, and embrace some of the adopt uh, uh, the agile and lean processes that, that people use today. Um, and, you know, it, these things aren't new. They've been around for, for a good number of years now. Um, I was explaining to somebody the, the other day that um, it's it's not just about producing software. It could be about anything. Um, so a uh, prime example is when Apple wanted to introduce uh, a laptop. They didn't go out and, and, and think, right, we'll, we'll build a, a sample and test it with, with our, our agreed demographic. So their agreed demographic at the time, they thought there, was going to be, there were going to be architects. Um, so they didn't do that. What they did was ask some, uh, a handful of art architects to carry a pizza box with them around all day with, with some, some weights in to, the, to, to mimic the, the, the size and weight of, of uh, a laptop. Uh, and from that, they gained a lot of experience and knowledge about what people would and wouldn't accept. 
So I think we've got, as part of our digital transformation, we, we need to think about um, those things before we, we go headlong and, and build something that actually somebody uh, users don't actually want. And, and these really are our building blocks uh, or, or tools that we can ensure that we're un undertaking the, the right digital uh, transformation journey. Um, now, I did say that I wasn't going to mention COVID. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure you're all really, really tired of it, um, but I can't talk about uh, a digital transformation journey and, and not mention uh, the, the pandemic. Um, so uh, I'm sure like everybody uh, on on the webinar tonight, today, uh, having the ability uh, to, to respond uh, and focus on COVID has has been a a really really um, you know focus for for all our attentions over the last nine months. Uh, for NHS Digital, having the ability to analyse large volumes of data and provide a rapid access to, you know, secure digital services uh, enabled us to to respond to, to the pandemic in ways we just didn't think. Uh, was possible a year ago. Everyone has stepped up, coming up, you know, coming together uh, to to drive change at a speed that we just didn't think was possible previously. Um, and working with some incredible partners and suppliers uh, to to make it happen. Um, in England, with NHS appointments and telephone uh, services facing uh, extreme pressure people turned to uh, digital services as a first point of, of contact. And we've seen that many times. So I guess it's important to note that um, at the heart of any uh, transformation, whether it's digital or not, uh, front and centre are the people. You know, that the colleagues, partners, suppliers, developers, clinicians and the patients it's been a tremendous effort to condense years of work into a matter of months, weeks, or, or even days in, in some instances. Um, we also need to be mindful that we are looking after the health and well-being through this phase of, of all uh, the workers, from frontline workers to those keeping the systems and services running 24 by seven. Um, it's been uh, an increased uh, amount of pressure for for everybody uh, and there's been some some really um, outstanding work by by everyone across the the NHS um, so dozens of studies uh, are, are going back to the data dozens of studies are, are using the data that um, we we provide uh, an example of that is the University of Ox Oxford's uh, recovery trial um, which provided one of the first breakthroughs uh, on treatment of, of COVID-19. You know, that was as a result of uh, uh, mining the data that, that, held, that is held by uh, NHS Digital. From my own perspective, um, you know, that the National Spine, uh, from a spine perspective, over the last, last six months, um, we've seen a growth in volumes of, of 38%. So that's taking the number of messages, messages that we manage to 1.3 billion a month. You know, that's quite, quite staggering. And, and that is we can point directly to responding to COVID for that increase in uh, volume. And uh, I guess let's talk about teams. Uh, it can't mention about uh, COVID and transformation, working at home, lockdown, without talking about Teams and Zoom and on all those 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 things. Um, you know, this won't be the first video interaction that you've had in the last nine months. I'm sure it won't be the last. Um, the the capability that we provided uh, through Teams has quickly been put in place to support the NHS. Um, and, you know, quite some stunning figures uh, around that. So 86.5 million chat messages have been uh, sent since uh, it was made available. 18.4 million meetings have been held and 7.8 million Teams calls have been held. 
oh, and, and probably about 30 million times that somebody has said to you, you're still on mute. So, so that's COVID. Uh, and apologies, I, I, I did need to, uh, I did need to, to, to mention COVID on, on our journey. Um, there, there's, there's one service um, that I, I did want to talk about very quickly, uh, and I know I'm, I'm running out of time a little bit. Uh, that's NHS login. Um, so accessing your uh, medical information using healthcare service has traditionally been done uh, on a human basis, analog interaction, whether that's ringing the surgery or visiting the, the doctor, pharmacist, pharmacist etc. Um, you know, there's an expectation these days that actually things will move to online. They will be di digital. And um, the the NHS login uh, uh, service platform is is one of those those key areas. So we, we developed a, a solution that took people through a journey to um, uh, identify themselves with proof uh, of identity, an online journey, um, making videos of themselves so that they, it could be checked for life lifeness. Uh, and lifelike, um, and um, that whole journey there is is pretty much uh, fully fully digital. Um, and you know that that's not just for for um, the, the health service. Obviously, other government uh, departments are, are doing similar things, and and you know driving license, renewing passports, etc., um, with a premise of of proving who you are and from that we will guide you to to what you you want to be able to do whether that is ordering repeat prescriptions or, or looking at your your records um so um i i've i've sort of talked about uh this a little bit on on the right here you can see some of the uh, organizations that are already using nhs login um it's it's uh, an area that is growing. There is a, a good deal of interest and uh, organisations wanting to use that uh, this service so that, you know, from a, a patient citizen expect, uh, uh, experience, you know, you're going through one journey and it will give you access to the things that that matter to you. Um, so, you know, I would put, put forward that as a as a key um, a key example of, of a great uh, digital transformation from, from that uh, analog uh, type of uh, interaction to something that is, is much more digital in, in its way it's, it, it's approached. Uh, and, and then finally, um, just the, the NHS log on, the user journey to, to log on, uh, very simple. Um, and that's it from from me so so that is my my digital um transformation journey um with the, the key things to think about you know make sure that we're doing it for the right reasons and not because we're jumping on the bandwagon of of everything everybody else is talking because everyone else is talking about uh, digital transformation so thank you fantastic thank you andrew i now wanted to introduce katie barnes Hi, everybody. I'm just going to pull up my screen here one second. Um, give me one minute. And yes, thanks, Deborah. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, GovConnect, my colleagues. Um, I'm thrilled to be here today to be talking about something that I love. So yeah, I'm Katie Barnes. I wear two hats. One is as the director of a very small social enterprise called Kids Health Matters Community Interest Company. And my second hat is in as an advanced pediatric nurse practitioner or advanced clinical practitioner in the new um, in the new lexicon in the emergency department at Alder Hay Children's. I'm going to speak to you today about what we did up here to transforming, or maybe Andrew, I'm going to let you all peek inside my pizza box here, of what we did. Um, and we transformed our little bit of NHS education and training, one flipped classroom at a time. 
a couple of other little introductions. One, you'll see Advance. Advance is our slice of the bigger pizza, if you will, our slice of the Panopto server. And also, um, I always mention Improving Me, which is the Cheshire and Merseyside Women's and Children's Service Partnership. We all came together as part of the NHS Vanguard Project. We were the only women's and children's one, and I would never, we would have never accomplished what we did if um, they hadn't enabled that to happen. So great, let's crack on. So what was our problem up here in the Northwest? Well, a very big problem was that we had a pediatric workforce crisis and crisis with a capital C. So we had this crisis, but what we did have is a very long history of advanced clinical practice in pediatrics. And we also had a whole lot of NHS clinicians familiar with that role and willing to support it. On the other end, we had um, the local universities. So the local higher education institutes, again, an established record of advanced practice programs, but at the time, whoops, um, they didn't have a pediatric or neonatal content. So our solution was to develop a shared resource. That was the idea. We were going to share it and we were going to put pediatric and neonatal clinical modules to develop that workforce in a cloud. Um, we are going to use the agility and the clinical relevance of a social enterprise and the agility was massive. And we are going to develop that special content there and then embed it into the university programs. I like to call it horses for courses because the university did what they did best, which was the research um, content, the dissertation, they had the award, they had, you know, status, royal charter as an awarding body. We had the NHS where we had all of our clinical sites and all of our clinicians. And then here is where we stepped into that middle space with the social enterprise to create this content. Um, Panopto, whoops, was our uh, video platform to do that. And now actually with the Zoom integration, um, it's actually improved our capacity with video conferencing, but we'll get to that. So that was the problem that we were trying to fix. Big workforce problem. Universities weren't cutting it. We moved into that space to fix it ourselves. So I want to just have a quick word about a flipped classroom before we go any further. And this um, picture here is Bloom's, it's a, the revised taxonomy of cognitive processes. It's essentially the ordering of cognitive skills from lower level skills, and then you go up to higher level cognitive skills. In a traditional classroom down here, the face-to-face -face time is spent um, oftentimes or traditionally with the remembering and the understanding. Bronchiolitis is a virus that comes in the wintertime, body, 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 body. And then after the lecture's over, everybody goes out and they apply, analyze, evaluate, create based on their remembering and understanding. In a flipped classroom, that's turned on its head because the self-directed piece is down here. And we use that digitally and we created digital content that was for the remembering and understanding. And then the actual face-to-face -face content and the application of that was with clinicians and it was through case-based discussions. And it's this flipped classroom concept or for clinicians, the application of this remembering and understanding to actual clinical cases that actually makes the learning relevant and much more sticky. Um, down here, actually, Chris is going to mention it as well. I think it'll be in your bulletin board or in the post webinar stuff, uh, one of the articles that kind of outlines that very well. So let's take a look. Let's open the pizza box and look inside. So this is how our advanced platforms organized. And you can see this is where our original stuff, which was the Kids Health Matters teaching. Um, it was all non-medical and largely advanced clinical practice, pediatrics, neonates, and we've added midwifery as well. Here was our postgraduate medical education department, if you will, where we had Cheshire Merseyside STEP program and Greater Manchester and Lancashire. That STEP is pediatric STEP, so specialty training um, educational program. If we go one layer deeper, this is actually into our Kids Health Matters department, and it was actually the 2018 group where we had a neonatal pathway, we had two pediatric pathways, we had a shared module, and then we have a folder for all the stuff to kind of get them ready, kind of watch telly to figure out what's going to happen. If we go one layer deeper, 
at here actually was the content of the module. So think about unraveling until we get to where we need to be. So topics like neonatal jaundice, safeguarding, infectious diseases, problems in dermatology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then if I pick just one topic, which was the cardiovascular, we can see here, and we needed to create some words. So this was our flexible content, as we called it. This was the learning and understanding piece. This was all recorded and it was placed online. There's always a science that's related to it and then some assessment and management, and it's asynchronous, meaning that it's there 24 seven, hence the name flexible. And then down here is our weekly lecture, because this mirrored a lot of what people were used to. The weekly lecture wasn't a lecture at all. It was a case-based application. And you can see, we sat around on a bunch of couches and we talked about and applied those cases. What you can't see here are all of the people that were actually face-to-face -face and then people that came online because it was, again, digitalized and it was webcast. Let's see what those interfaces, and yeah, we call this scheduled. So those were the live weekly case-based applications. When we look at the interface, so this is what the user sees in terms of their um, flexible content. In fact, you can tell I'm not any place different. There's a number of functionality. We have a whole table of contents here. You can make notes. You can make bookmarks. Um, you have the slides here. I do this exact thing that I'm doing now, although I didn't have four, however many hundreds of people on the other end. I just had me. You also have some functionality down here where you can speed things up, you can slow them down, you can attach slides so that we make each video a separate learning unit. You can go backwards, forwards, et cetera, et cetera. This actually is what the interface looked like in the recording for the live session. And you can see one of our ED consultants and we were talking about a 15 month old uh, with uh, syncope, yes? but they had to figure out same sort of functionality. And what you see over here is actually the chat from the uh, distance learners. So Blackpool, um, Northern Ireland, um, uh, Shrewsbury, most were Cheshire Mersey and sometimes they're Cheshire Mersey, but they had sick kids at home or, and obviously pre COVID, um, no, no masks, but there were reasons sometimes why local, uh, tr you know, participants needed to, uh, come online as well for many different reasons. They weren't well or whatever. It gave us tremendous flexibility. Now, um, with the Zoom integration, it doesn't look too different and chat still gets carried through. So again, option of face-to-face -face, and you can see somebody's head here or it was webcast. So our headline wins. What did this change, this transformation, what did it achieve for us? Well, we created an e-model of delivery for education and training, and nobody had done that before. We'd had previous iterations, but the functionality wasn't so great, and we certainly hadn't flipped the classroom. So we now had an e-model of delivery that was working very well. In fact, it was working so well in 2016 when we started, it was pre-COVID, and that's the only time I'm going to say COVID. But we, in creating this e-learning e platform, we had no idea how it would come into our its own and allow us to continue to deliver regular our regular weekly television show, if you will, um, even though COVID was in fact going on. Um, we created that workforce. In fact, we're still doing that. There's an extra 113 pediatric neonatal and midwifery advanced practice hands that have now been delivered to or in process of delivering um, to the NHS. Lots of them are there already. We have a few finishing up. Um, that's made a huge difference. We also have all of this multi-professional pediatric advanced practice contact, which is paramedics. It's respiratory. Uh, they're physiotherapists. Um, and a large number of nurses. And that because it's digitalized, it's in pieces that you can move around. And Chris is going to talk with you about how that's really been raised to another level. And then lastly, our newest uh, piece that we added into the platform was digitalization of the Northwest Pediatric Postgraduate Medical Education. And 400 trainees, pediatric trainees up here, now can access all of their content either on the day by distance or can go back to it, but I'll leave Chris for that. Some 
takeaway messages because I think we're doing okay time-wise. I've lost my clock. Um, but one, these are messages for you if you are thinking about this to be brave. Don't be afraid. Be brave. To keep it simple, uh, at least certainly when you're starting, and it looks much more complicated than it is, trust me, I barely know how to work my phone. I really and truly. Um, it's really important to for you to be um, or for people to see what you want them to be, I guess is the, is the way to say that. If you're not willing to kind of be vulnerable and give it a go, you probably won't get much engagement there, which is the other part. Get the engagement right, and then everything else will take care of itself. In terms of e-learning systems, make it accessible. My takeaway thing, and Chris is going to talk about that, make it accessible. Learning, education, training shouldn't be locked up. Yeah. Make it clinically relevant. That's really important. Um, make it fun. We have enough stuff that we have to do that's not fun. If we can make it at least a little bit fun, no harm there. Lastly, there's a developmental component or second to last, there's a developmental component. My expression is that you can't yell at seeds. It doesn't matter how much I want those sunflowers to grow. They're not going to grow any faster. So people will get there. And then lastly, uh, yeah, critical friends, really important. Mm, the tire kickers, especially when you're starting out, maybe you want to stay with some really positive people. So that's it for me. Chris is going to really open your eyes. A big thanks there, my details. And a little shout out to my oldest daughter who's actually joined us. Hi, Caitlin. Thanks a <laughs> million. Sorry I had to get that in. Okay, Chris, over to you. I'm going to stop sharing. Sorry for that commercial interruption there. Thanks, Katie. That was amazing. And Katie's been a huge inspiration to what we've done uh, in the East Living Living, which I'll just share with you now. The um, sh She was one of the first pioneers of what we're doing. Uh, and I really want to try and open your mind about how we've expanded that a little bit um, in the East of England. So I'm an anesthetic and intensive care registrar in the east of england and also work as an he education fellow and we spent quite a few uh probably about two years thinking about how can we open up regional teaching um for doctors in training throughout the nhs and we took the east of england as a small pilot on how to do that so as always you, you always and as katie has done you always look at the problem and what what was wrong with regional training in the first place and just for those of you who might not know about how regional training works um it's it, regional training for doctors is done in a very is a, is a very sort of siloed affair so each specialty has a, a bunch of training days that they go to every month or every other month but it's always face to face and it's always pretty much 99 percent of the time lecture based uh, and that was the first sort of part of the problem. How do you deliver that sort of education, that sort of didactic lecture based education to a large group of trainees who have all different training pathways uh, and have to travel across uh, a very large geographical area like the east of England, which goes from Luton all the way to Norfolk? How do you make that a lot more efficient and how can you also help um, increase the cross specialty access to education? It wasn't all bad, though. I think. In our region, we had really good feedback from the teaching we, that happened uh, face to face. Uh, and we were pretty good on the GMC survey in terms of we were fifth in the UK for all uh, satisfaction surveys and regional teaching. Um, and then that's about out of 13, I think. And we were doing very well in exams across all specialties. Our trainees were doing extremely well. They were passing first time and getting really good marks. But what we did notice was that even though feedback was really good from those live face to face training sessions, not even half of the trainees could get there. Um, and that was because they weren't. There was a lot of commuting time. Uh, training days started at a very unholy hour, usually right in the middle of traffic, right in the middle of rush hour. You had to pay for parking. You had to pay for your own lunches. Um, and also getting a venue sorted out was an absolute nightmare uh, in an already quite packed out um hospital so we also did an audit to say actually how far are trainees going for this sort of education and in the east of england well over half of trainees had to have to travel at least over 45 minutes to get anywhere uh, and that wasn't without traffic so that wasn't you know that doesn't set up a great educational platform in itself so what was the goal here well we wanted to find figure out how we can make 
all of this education more accessible. But we wanted to do it in a way that used the the models that Katie was using and also what Andrew was alluding to about these agile and lean processes. But we took a sidestep and actually went for a more of a systems approach where we looked at the, all the systems within our region and thought, how can these be integrated in a way that allows us to deliver education much e more easily? And we came up with these goals and objectives that helped us um, identify the stakeholder needs, but also satisfied their wants and there's always a different in any digital transformation project there's always a battle between the need and the want because they don't always match up um, and these goals i think after a huge amount of stakeholder analysis really allowed us to do that and what we essentially came up with was that the way that we deliver education has to be accessible it has to be trainee and educator centered it has to enable and reflect a wide variety of learning styles and teaching styles. We have to be able to measure how well we are teaching and, um, and delivering, and it has to be evidence-based, be it digitally or not. And we looked at a lot of evidence around digitalizing education and what the best way to do it. And as uh, Katie was alluding to, the flipped classroom was a huge part of that, and we saw that how Katie was doing it uh, was hugely successful. Um, and especially when it came to anesthesia in general, which is that sort of my little passion. Uh, but what also was becoming more apparent was that videos were becoming not just effective in postgraduate medical education, but undergraduate and even preschools. So video is, 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 the fun, is, can, is gonna be a fundamental tool of how people are learning from now on, and that's from, even from the undergraduate level. So we need to bring that forward into the postgraduate setting. So how how do how do we get all these things together to come up with some sort of solution? Well, we looked at the flip the flip classroom and thought, right, how can we put how can we capture all of the face to face lectures that people are delivering and make them into more accessible learning units rather than having four hour lecture recordings? How can we capture these days? And, and piece them up so that they can be much more digestible in a very quick and efficient manner. And that was so important because we are all very time poor, but we also need to have very, very high quality and very accurate uh, educational tools that we can get to from either our pocket or from our computer very quickly. So what we did is we got Panopto's sort of model that Katie was using, we thought, right, let's capture all these face-to-face -face lectures and put them in a centralized video library. But we can also live stream them at the same time to trainees up here. So if they're unable to get to a live face-to-face -face lecture, they can always stream it from their mobile or from wherever they are at the time. Equally, if lecturers couldn't get to the actual lecture, they could pre-record a lecture that allows them to upload it to the library so trainees can view it. And that can be at anything. That could be from their phone, from their um, from their mobile device, and that's the same for lectures. Equally, if you wanted to do a big webinar, we also need to be able to put that into a storage library, which Panopto allows us to do. But we took it one step further and thought, how how can we administrate all this as well as store it? And how can this be done in a way that allows trainees to pick their own learning pathways? So we in introduced a learning management system called Bridge that helped bring all of this together. And I'll show you how that works right now. So the components to our learning management system were literally just the software package bridge. It integrated into Panopto and all the only other piece of hardware we needed was a webcam. And what the LMS or bridge allowed us to do was it allowed us to make the learner the center of the learning pathways. So if you can see in the middle of this diagram, there's a learner here and they interact with either Panopto to view any regional training event that's happened and been recorded, be it a webinar or face-to-face -face teaching. They can enroll on an online course that you can build yourself within Bridge. So you can build online training packages, very similar to eLearning for Health, but maybe just uh, a step forward in some respects. And they can also interact with a live regional training day calendar, and that's for all specialties across the region which means that an anaesthetist can now register onto an event for an, a cardiologist and they can be attending the, side, the same live event. So we've completely blown open how people interact and how they can access education. Every doctor, and you've probably seen this, um, it, they all have a certificate. So everything needed to be certified. Um, 
and that can be done for a live event or an online course. So let me just take you into the world that we built. And if you can see that, uh, this is the bridge platform here. And let me just give it a little refresh. So this is the front page of the, of the bridge platform. And you can see we have categories of all, um, all of our specialties here that you can, you can go through. And these are online courses that have been built within bridge. And I can self enroll onto these at any point. Equally, I can go to my training calendar. And I can show, I can see what's happening this month across all the specialties in the east of England. And I can register on a ACCS regional training day, which are the sort of baby um, emergency medicine doctors. I can also go to the senior emergency medicine doctors program. And I'm in an Eastist. I'm not in any of these groups. So I can just register for that. And it will send me a Zoom link. Uh, once this event has happened, I can go back into Panopto through Bridge. And I can view any event that's happened throughout our region. So we've got all of these folders here, very similar to what Katie's done. We've split it up into these public um, specialty based folders that allows us to go into each category and figure out what we want to learn. Because there is definitely a constructivist way of learning where you need to be able to look into a place to see what you want to learn. So now there's all these lectures that you can go through and also you can embed them into Bridge as an online course. So I could take snippets of this video and put it into an online course that I can build. And you can build them very quickly, the platform we have here. But Panopto is absolutely critical to that because it allows us to capture all of that amazing content contemporaneously as it happens through how the lecturers are using it. So this is our online um, course builder. And as you can see, we've got Panopto right here. And I can I can drag a video straight from Panopto, and it usually takes a second to connect. And I it connects to our online video library. And I can go straight into that uh, surgical folder that we saw. And I can just pick out a video. And I can insert it into an online course in a few seconds. It usually takes a few minutes, but now I've got a video in a whole course that I can now pepper with all sorts of information. I can write around it. I can pop this out of the video. I can also interact with it. So I can ask people just questions and I can have my own notes and I can search the whole video. And that is why video is so important because I can search the video and it picks out exactly what I'm looking for. And that's in the PowerPoint and in the speech which means now education is not just cross, it's not just cross specialty, but now I can really deep dive into that content. If you want to know more about this, because I, I don't want to go over time, but if you want to know more about this, uh, we'll send you a link to this website here, which is the HE website for the, la the learning platform in our region. And there's loads and loads of stuff on here that you can view this little, great little video. Um, and it, you can see how it's structured. And there are lots of these tools that we used on the website we can build into this platform here. So I hope that's given you a little insight into how we work and how things have been working for us. Um, it's been an absolutely amazing journey for us. And been, we've been amazingly lucky to have Katie and Deborah uh, on our side and also HE who've been working with NHS Digital and um, supporting us. So it's been great. Perfect. Thank you so much, Chris. That was very good. Um, I also wanted to bring everyone's attention now that we have Q&A that we do have two polls. Um, I think you can access them if you go to polls. The first one is what percentage of your professional training was delivered, recorded pre-COVID? Sorry, go it again. Um, and so feel free um, to start taking that one. And we also have one more if you'd like to take in the interim, we'll look. Um, do you feel you will use video to access record training sessions after the pandemic? So we have those two there. I'll come back to that in a second. Let's go into Q&A. Uh, Katie, you have a huge fan base. We had a lot of shout outs to you. <laughs> Um, so let me look. I tried to keep track as, as many as I could. I did get disconnected, everyone. I'm so sorry. So I don't have all the questions. I might just start at the beginning or well, the most recent. One of them, I think this is probably to you, Chris, um, is the HEE EOE, so East of England Learning Hub, something that is available to other regions? Um, it 
It isn't at the moment. However, what I would say is to get in touch with HEE Technology Enhanced Learning, and they can guide you through ways of getting hold of it if you want. Um, we have, there are other regions uh, who have, are looking into it as well. My advice to you there would be to just reach out to Health Education England Technology Enhanced Learning, um, and they can they can definitely steer you in the right direction. Good, thank you, Chris. Um, the next one I see is, oh, with Panopto, any consent issues and issues with copywriting, especially, of course, will be payable. Uh, that's a good question. In regards to the content, who owns it, just to let you know, um, the customer 100% owns all the content in Panopto. So it's up to the organization, how your own media policy. So I might hand that over to Katie or Chris for some background. Yeah, Chris, do you want to go and then I'll follow up? Yeah, so um, when it comes to putting up any educational content, as Deborah was saying, the intellectual property resides with the lecturer who's created that content. So uh, we send that, if they want that content back, we send it back to them. There's no real digital trail. When it comes to copyright um, and consent, it, there's sort of two aspects to that, I think. Uh, one is patient consent, and the onus is always on the lecturer to maintain patient consent. So if they're going to record uh, a patient, they need to get uh, formal consent, and there's guidance on the GNC website about how to get uh, patient recordings public. Um, and there's there's forms on there as well. But there's also the copyright rules, which is that most uh, we are HEE are deemed as an educational institution, so there are some exemptions to copyright um, that we can leverage, especially if you're using it for the purposes of instruction or education. So you can use any third third party material in that respect. However, as a, as a course of good practice, we always ask permission for third party materials. Uh, and by no one can really, if anyone wants to share anyone else's content in our platform, they have to just send an email to the creator and say, look, do you mind if I use this or do you mind if I use that? Uh, and that's all they need. We don't, we try not to bureaucratize it too much. Um, I don't know how Katie, you manage it, but. Yeah, similar. GDPR was really, really, really important. Yeah. And the copyright thing is really important. And I think GDPR is something that people don't understand super well. Teams, I, you know, there's sometimes staff meetings or, you know, I, and I'll say, you guys, we're taping, we're, we're taping. Yeah, I can tell. All right, we're recording it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, where's that thing go? I told you, if I can do this, any of you guys can do it. I'm telling you. And I'll say, where's this thing going? And oh, nobody has a clue. So the GDPR thing was really important. So we have actually Kids Health Matters, and we're, you know, kind of tiny, but for the, actually, once we stepped up to the postgraduate medical education guys, we pared that down. It's for educational purposes. It's, it's just like a, it's a consent to record, actually, that says your voice, your hair, your image is all your data. This is how it'll be stored. We're registered with the information governance, blah, 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 all new learning for me, trust me. But the long and the short of it was their content is their content. The recording sits on a protected password, protected place. If you want it, you can download it. Um, the our advanced practice guys are a small group. The post graduate postgraduate medical education they can get download PDFs um, and, that are placed on that, as well as they can download an MP4. Um, and then similar to you, Chris, anybody wants anything other than that, you just have to ask. It's not you know it's a social enterprise that by rights should be in the NHS, but we needed agility, so yeah. that's why it sits there. Yeah, and it's it's just worth saying that you can lock all these videos down. So yeah. you can say no one's allowed to download them, uh, but you can open them up individually if you wanted to in some respects. So it's very controllable and it's very scalable. And equally, when you're recording a, a trainee or, or you're recording a bunch of trainees, if the trainee, there's a bit of psychological yeah. safety involved yeah. to say, we're just about to record. If anyone doesn't want to be recorded, you must speak up now. And the, the, you have to give them time to make a decision. And if a trainee doesn't want to be recorded, they are not recorded. No. Um, and that's all in the upfront agreement. So that there's there's lots of I's to dot and T's to cross with regards to that, for sure. 
Yeah, it is that that piece is is really important. People understanding that piece and what happens that day, and it is it's a big responsibility. Um, the ability to move stuff around and open up access to different things is really handy. We had a group of new physicians associates join us, and they didn't have a huge background in pediatrics. It was a piece that so you could you could pull some things together. Chris does it. You do it in a really grand scale. When COVID hit, the neonatal uh, grid trainee induction couldn't happen, but we could create an online induction for them um, in order to keep to keep the wheels on the wagon. Um, keep the wheels on the wagon. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I just was messaged one. There was one question I missed, which I'll read here. Also, Andrew, thank you so much. He's been answering questions in the background. That's been fantastic. You've been the best. Um, so one question I missed because I was disconnected. So this is from earlier. It said, um, the move to online services is a positive one, but I wonder how have you supported older people and those who haven't um, haven't the digital skills to make the switch? That's a really good question. Um, I'll just answer that from a Panopto perspective. Um, so what we've noticed is it's not necessarily the technology because Panopto is easy to use. It was designed for end users. Everything is done in the background. You don't have to do anything special. It's more around change management and getting people excited about the, the change, understanding why we're doing it. Um, and so we do have a whole like onboarding system dedicated to this. Uh, you have a dedicated customer success advocate that's here to deliver training and to help with that change management. And what we've noticed with academics and doctors, they love research and we have tons of research on the benefits of um, this type of education. i am also hand that over to Katie, Chris as well to add their um, points to it. Yeah, that, that idea, it is, it's evolution and you can't yell at seeds. You can't, doesn't matter how much I want that sunflower to grow faster, it doesn't grow. So bringing people along, lots of support. And it is, if you get the engagement right and keep your sense of humor, you'd, you'd be surprised. They are, you're not really doing anything different in terms of the, you're still learning, you're still going to, it's just the how, it's not the what, the what's the same. So some reassurance in those pieces. And, and then some people don't like it. So if you don't like it, that's okay. Um, that's absolutely okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll second that, uh, Katie. And I think um, there's an element also of making people aware that it's okay, it's okay to get it wrong. Don't <laughs> worry. If you get it wrong, we'll do it again. Uh, and the the what we've tried to do in the east of England is really promote a culture of of change in terms of we've we've really set up a, a very strong educational unit through HE East of England that allows doctors to just pop into drop in sessions to really start to practice using Zoom, practice using Teams. Um, we've we've set up a, a website that takes them through tutorials on all of that stuff, but also how to use the platform and how to build online content because there's one thing that i think has been missing for a long time in medical education is that the building online education is actually it's a privilege of instructional designers and we're trying to break that boundary and say actually we're missing a huge amount of information by um not allowing doctors or professionals or nurses to build online content because they understand that content better than anybody um and we are really trying to educate them on how to build that so there is a bit of an education uh push as well but it's also giving them that sort of safe space that sandbox environment where they could fall over and get up and it's fine Fantastic. Yeah, compared to, you know, the emergency department, what's so bad? You get disconnected. Nobody dies. It is. Compared to what yeah. you do in the day job, you must be joking. And it is. It is doable. It just looks a little overwhelming. Um, but it is definitely doable. Excellent. I have one more question here. Um, uh, oops, where did I? Oh, oh, are there any plans for this to be rolled out to other regions? Maybe that's to Chris. <laughs> um, the hundred million dollar question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There, there, there is a lot of discussion around that. Um, there's a lot of discussion around that. Is probably all I can say right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Chris says he's trying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, let me see. Um, Let's see. Oh, there's another one from Andrew. But I think Andrew's been answering his, so he's on it. Um, yeah, Andrew, I'm not even sure how you're doing that. Yeah, <laughs> very, very impressed. There, I just go by and I'm like, oh, Andrew's responded. 
Let's see. Oh, here's a question. I'm not quite sure of this one. I don't think it was answered from um, June Beddoes. Do software suppliers need to work in open systems environments now? Um, okay. Um, so let me think about what, what that means. So, so at the moment, uh, there are um, ways to connect to national services. They tend to be fairly old ways. They're, they're sort of old standards, um, quite hard to, to integrate with. What we're doing at the moment is, is developing uh, modern-based um, uh, APIs to, to make it a lot simpler for, for organizations to connect and consume those, those services. Obviously, the thing we want people to do is to, we want people to make make it easy for people to connect those services, and then for them to to innovate on top of the platforms that that we provide. Um, so um, when when you say open systems, yeah, we're trying to make them as open and accessible uh, as as possible uh, within the, the the realms the realms of you know is there a, a legal uh, justification for access have we got the ig have we got the security in place so along with all those things then yes that's what we're we're aiming for perfect thank you andrew and i know i do realize we're now at two o'clock i just wanted to quickly share the uh survey results i'm not sure if rob if we were able to share that on the screen if not just tick the polls um so i don't see where the other one went i don't know if i did something but anyways for the one do you feel you will use video to access Record. That was me. I think Deborah. Sorry, I pressed oh. reset. Pull. Never give me the control. That was me. It disappeared. I'm like, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, Katie. I love you. I enjoyed that. Um, so <laughs> we have the results from the second one. So, do you feel you will use video to access record training sessions after the pandemic? We had 51% say definitely all the time. Fantastic. Give you guys a round of applause there. We have 48% uh, sometimes in specific circumstances, and we had 0% say no way or undecided. So that's really, really good. So it seems that video is here and it is a valuable tool in regards to sharing knowledge and information as well as, in your case, expert knowledge. Fantastic. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you for the panelists. Thank you, Rob. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, I think as Rob said, this will be posted online. You can download the slides. And if you do have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to help. Thank you all again. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.